All right. Well, here we are. We are back. We're talking about homeschooling in the martial arts. And to say it a different way, martial arts for homeschool students. And an opportunity that I see coming back on episode 513, we talked about this. And by we, I mean me. I talked about this, brought up this subject and said, hey, this is something that I think some of you need to look at. But I would love some feedback and got a bunch of emails from a bunch of different people. It was great. I learned a lot. And I'm back with two of those people who wrote in. So let me introduce them and then I'll let them talk. And we're going we're gonna to go from there. And I think you're going to learn a lot with this one. I'm going to introduce Sensei Jenny first, only because she's a returning guest. Uh, Sensei Jenny was on the show episode 464. We dug into her story there. And it was, it was a great story. And I'm, I'm glad to have you back. Thank you. It's good to... Good to get a chance to talk with you again. Yeah, yeah, this will be fun. And then new to the show, Sensei Jason is on. So, sir, thank you. I appreciate you joining us and your willingness to talk on the subject. Yes, thanks for having me. Thanks for the topic as well. Of course. Well, and let's let's start with you. So what was it, if you could, you know, in 60 seconds or less, what was it about this idea of, martial arts and homeschool students that you wrote to me about and said, Hey, here's my, here's what I think. Right. Um, 60 seconds or less, um, moved to a different state. Kids couldn't go to school because they were too young because of the age cut off. So I had to homeschool my own kids. I was teaching martial arts shortly after that and said, Hey, I've got this time in the middle of the day. Why don't I start a homeschool class for other homeschool students? That's pretty much it. All right. That's, that's succinct. I think that was 20 seconds. All right. Jenny. Yes. Um, so I was that homeschooled student. Uh, I was homeschooled all, all growing up. Uh, I started doing martial arts lessons at about 12 years old. Obviously those were late afternoon classes, which it was interesting. Even back then I thought to myself, well, there's this gap between when I do school and when we have karate classes, right? Cause it was karate. Um, Fast forward 30 years, here we are today. Roughly 75% of our students currently are homeschool students. Oh, wow. Right now. And that's honestly due to word of mouth. You know, one family says this is great to another family, to another family, to another family, and here we are. Um, so we've been able to cater our school, our school's schedule to them a lot more than others. Now, obviously, we have to make sure we balance everything. but. Mm. Yeah, and we homeschool our own kids, so I feel like uh, I feel like it's something that I'm very comfortable with, and I see the benefits, I see the positives and negatives. But yeah, mm. I've got a feeling that most of the programs out there that people are doing for homeschool students, or let's just say more generically, during unconventional hours, right? There there are times during the day that people are used to martial arts classes, and they tend to be after school, after school, after work. But those daytime classes, there are lots of reasons that somebody might have some of those. Certainly, there are adult programs. I've seen those growing as people start working more and more, uh, let's say, untraditional work hours. But you brought up something that I think is pretty important for us to start with as a subject, and that's word of mouth. It's my understanding that in each geographic area, the, the homeschool community tends to be pretty tight-knit. Is that yeah. something that you've both found? Jason, why don't you start? Yeah. Um, so this, my homeschool journey started in Indiana. Um, also kind of started with the congregation of the church that I was attending, um, where everything was heavily geared towards uh, curriculum. Uh, I think the major curriculum players, uh, Becca, um, out of frustration, I kind of called the Department of Education and said, hey, what's the regulations? Uh, you can do this yourself. So I kind of broke away from the community uh, that existed. But at the same time, they were a wealth of information. So there's like, here's this group, and this is when we meet and we do things together. Here's another group. Um, everybody got along. It was just differences in, in, in what curriculum you had used or, or what activities or, or frankly, schedules uh, that they had together. Uh, just uh, I think of one family of seven kids, all homeschooled, uh, pastor's wife. So they were kind of their own microcosm, if you will, because they had so many kids right in their house. Um, sure. But then they would teach other people. People would bring their kids to them. So they had, I think, 20 some kids that they would teach uh, just to that one family. Um, so just as an example, um, 
mention real quick back in Michigan, um, I went to college with a friend who was part of, I can't remember the name of the group, um, but they in Grand Rapids, Michigan had a very large homeschool building. So all the different people would go in and do their homeschool at their respective houses. And then they would join together and they would have things like band, uh, sports teams. Uh, uh, I, I wish I could remember the name of it, but it's pretty impressive. Um, and I think they called it actually the homeschool building. Um, Oh, wow. And Jenny, it looked like you were nodding along to just about everything Jason said. So does that kind of mirror your experiences? It does, yeah. Um, there are quite a few co-ops. Uh, there's quite a few homeschool co-ops, like like Jason said, for um, things like science, club, uh, science clubs. Uh, and I've actually been invited several times to come teach, say, a 12-week course within one of those co-ops uh, you know, and they said, we, we don't want your full curriculum, but can you just come and do 12 weeks, you know? Um, and uh, so there's a lot of opportunities. And once for us, once we have a family um, of students in one of those co-ops, it tends to spread, you know, they, the moms sit and talk and the kids talk. And if they're excited about what we're doing, then that excitement spills out to somebody else. And then pretty soon we get, you know, at, at times we've had six or seven different families email or call and say, Hey, we heard about you from so-and-so. What are your hours? What do you do? What do you teach? Tell us more, which is fantastic. And uh, it's really just spread from there. And, you know, thinking about it locally, there are five different co-ops that our students are a part of. And that's where, you know, we've actually, I'm terrible at marketing because I simply haven't had the experience. I haven't needed to. Mm. Yeah. We actually have waiting lists for our classes because we just, we don't have the space. So. <laughs> That's a great yeah. problem to have. Yeah. 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 When we consider this, this whole idea, this idea of homeschooling, especially if we're talking about teaching these classes during the day, right? Because if, if we were just talking about a general class that was at these traditional times, late afternoon, evening, it, it really doesn't matter when the kids are going to school or, or what their academic program is. But I think that we're talking specifically about classes that would occur during the day. And I don't think anybody's going to argue that if you're a full-time instructor, this is a great opportunity because it's a time that you're not typically going to be able to teach. Uh, if you work a full-time job, maybe that's not available to you and, and your interest might be more uh, theoretical than practical, and that's okay. But I want to talk about that that word of mouth, that kind of, it, it almost sounds viral, this jumping on. I mean, I kind of heard it from, from both of you that these communities of people are really looking for what we offer as martial artists. And I'm curious why. Jason. I never thought to ask why. I was just happy that there were lots of students willing to learn. Um, and their parents were like uh, Sensei Jenny said, doing, most of the marketing for me. Um, I think convenience was a factor. I think willingness to listen to how they structured and, and, and learn a few things from those communities was also a factor because um, I tried to uh, do my homework as much as I can, but it took you know more of a grassroots talking directly to the people. Um, uh, a willingness to be flexible, certainly. Um, I, and not to say that non homeschool students don't have this, but just just from the students themselves, a hunger for knowledge. Mm. Um, it wasn't just kicking and punching. It was thoughtful questions about history, uh, about my experience, about family. Uh, sometimes I get some odd questions about homework. Hey, Sensei Jason, you're good at math. Well, yeah, I was an engineer before, so I, I, I know all this math. But <laughs> So there was some tutoring involved as well. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so if it makes sense, I guess I felt more like a community member than I did kind of an, an, an outside sensei or an outside source. Yeah. Um, it was really kind of an adopting of each other's like, hey, okay, we're going to um, have you meet these students. and. Um, let's develop a true relationship, not just a martial arts sensei student relationship, mm -hmm. but uh, learning about each other, about the community, supporting each other, uh, supporting others in the community. Um, yeah, just thinking of examples. Hey, these kids don't want to take class, but can they come hang out because their brothers and sisters are doing it? Well, yeah, of course you can. Um, it sounds like it's it's less about 
them coming to you and more them in, inviting you in. Yes. Is, is, I, you, is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Certainly. Um, just, and I'll tell you the experience when I started going to a certain congregation and just looking, of course, you can't look at a, a 10 kids and say, who's homeschooled, who goes to traditional, who goes to private, that type of thing. Um, but some of them, again, caught me by surprise. It caught me by surprise that a pastor's wife that had seven children decided to homeschool all of them. And we're talking about kids from then age two on up to 17 years old. Wow. And I'm like, wow, you are truly a saint. How do you <laughs> keep track of all that? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Anybody who's ever taught a mixed age mixed rank martial arts class knows the challenge of doing that for, you know, say an hour and then to do that for a school day, five days a week throughout the, the year. That's, that's quite, quite a long time. Jenny, do you have any insight as to what, what it is that's maybe unique in the homeschool communities that they're, they're so intrigued and, and willing to bring in martial arts? I think one element is um, when you're in a traditional school setting, there are a lot of teams and there are a lot of clubs and a lot of opportunities for kids mm. to be part of. But those opportunities are typically offered as a single experience. I want to play basketball in sixth grade. I want to play softball in fourth grade. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Martial arts is different in that especially with our homeschool students, when they start, they come in and go, okay, here's the belts on the wall from white to black. So basically we're in this for the long haul. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like that's a perspective, especially as Sensei Jason just said, you know, you see these families with four, five, six, seven kids, they're in it for the long haul, their perspective. And I think the perspective that they pass on to their kids is when we do something, we do it whether it's hard, mm. we, we stick with it. We're going to keep you and we're going to work through these things with you. And we're going to find a way to meet you where you're at. I think a lot of times, not that public school or private school, we'll say traditional schooling is wrong. It's just, it's a system and it works for a lot of kids, but a lot of kids get lost through the cracks, you know? And yeah. so I think with homeschooling, you don't have that opportunity to lose a kid through the cracks very much. So when they come to martial arts, we see them kind of the wheels start turning. They're asking those questions, as Sensei Jason said. They're not just like, okay, what do I got to do for my next belt? Typically, sure. or if it's a generalization, but they're thinking, all right, what is this all about? And once they're in, they really invest. I just, um, I, I see a little bit more of a, uh, the whole family's invested. And uh, um, I think that makes that makes it unique. That makes the, their draw towards something like martial arts unique. And they come in and they say, you're going to stick with my kid for eight years. You want like, you know, you're not here for a soccer season, you know, um, you're here and you're going to take them all the way through. And so that is appealing to them. One of the things that I've noticed in elementary and, and, maybe even up a little little higher, seventh, eighth grade is kind of where it seems to top out in my area, is that they're starting to assign teachers for multiple years. So a kid might have the same teacher for third and fourth grade, and then another for fifth and sixth grade. So, you know, as they go through those four years, they have two teachers instead of four. And it sounds like some of what I'm hearing from you might be similar in that they're able to build stronger relationships and we're seeing the value of that. And here, here we are as martial arts instructors. I mean, if, if we raise someone from white to black belt or whatever the equivalence might be in a particular style, that's a multi-year commitment. That's I mean, generally on the super fast track, we're talking three to four years. Most schools, I think we're talking four, five, six years, sometimes even longer. That's a long commitment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've talked about some of the good. Let's, let's maybe talk about some of the more challenging aspects. There are plenty of stigmas about homeschool students, and I, I hope that people listening that 
um, might have some of those thoughts will realize, hey, if if some of these cliches about homeschool students being antisocial and not knowing how to converse, if if you're not experiencing those, that doesn't mean it's not a homeschool student. It means it's a well-adjusted kid, right? It, it's um, there. There will always be outliers. There will always be things that stick out. So beyond that. Um, let, let's talk about what some of the, the challenges are in teaching this population. Uh, Sensei Jason. I'm trying to think. I, I think the most challenging thing was for me having my own kids in the class. Because um, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's that whole, uh, you know, your, your kid, your dad's the instructor. And of course, we practice at home. So I was always concerned about everybody else feeling like a step behind because I could say something to the kids, Hey, do this or go shoot this. Um, and I never got the impression or the look or even the question, you know, it can be, Oh, why, why is he always picking that person to do that or demonstrate that? Or, Oh, he's just picking his own uh, kid to do that. Um, and, and I say that was a challenge maybe in my mind. Um, I never had any one say anything to me with that. If there was something to be said, I would hear it right away, usually from the parents. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up in inner city um, and where I taught in some of those places, sometimes the only chance the kids would have to have a meal is when they're in school. So when I taught after school, I would make it a point to bring snacks with me so I can send them off with something maybe they hadn't eaten all day. So I just, for whatever reason, carry that habit with me into the homeschool classes that I was teaching. So at the end of class, it's like, hey, come get a snack. And I made sure it was a healthy snack, you know, raisins, grapes, stuff like that. Um, uh, one uh, one of the parents just said out loud, and I did, still don't know how to take it, and I didn't really address it, just said out loud, oh, I would never use food as a reward. And uh, I was kind of mm-hmm. taken aback. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and I kind of joked about it. And, I'm, and I said to students, I'm like, okay, well, is Mrs. So-and-so right? Um, and I looked specifically at her son. I said, this is where you say, yes, always back up your mother, you know, <laughs> but I thought about it, but then I'm like, okay, is there something to be said or was it just, I, I don't know. So I guess I'm really struggling for any real challenges. Um, so I didn't really have as many problems discipline wise. Ah, I guess the only real problem, if you want to say it was sibling rivalry. Um, and sometimes is that stronger siblings, in, in a homeschool population. <sighs> I don't know that it was stronger. Um, it would be the, the, the example I'm thinking of is when the younger student was getting the concept and they were telling the older student to do it mm. this way. And the older student, the big brother didn't like it. So I kind of thought, okay, well maybe the big brother is the one used to telling, you know, taking care of the younger one or whatever, sure. but now the little one has got the concept telling big brother how to do it. And now he's got this look on his face. Mm. Um, I, again, not a super big deal. It was just something that happened that, that, stood out to me and then you know by the end of class everybody is cool um, and and i and i could see that and that that could make sense i would imagine you know i i was not homeschooled but i had a number of friends who were and from my understanding it's generally a more collaborative environment wh- where whoever's we'll say administering generally the parent um how you get there maybe doesn't matter so much. It's less about the structure, the system. I think one of you referred to it as the system of public private education, but the focus is on learning. And so if that education comes from an older sibling, being able to explain it better, that's okay. Whereas in our typical setup of a martial arts school, we have that top down because of the importance of nuance, right? Martial arts isn't, um, you know, an A, B, on, off, black, white, you know, super objective thing. There's a lot of subjectivity that comes through. So I, I could see that being challenging at times. Uh, Sensei Jenny, how about challenges you've experienced teaching these, these kids? Um, it's funny because I was actually trying to think of some of the challenges that we've faced over the last, let's see, last few years. Um, one of them that is anecdotal, but it has been real is um, we tend to assume that kids know how to act and conduct themselves in a group setting. Mm. Um, some of them do great. They've done co-ops, their, their parents have brought them out to lots of things and some haven't had that experience. For some of them, our class is the very first time that they're required to do things 
that in school you kind of just learn in order to get along. Um, for example, we have everyone line up. Um, that's extremely hard for some of these kids. They don't wait in line quietly for anything ever at home because they don't have to. Sure. And that's not wrong. But when we expect that of them and we explain what it is that we're expecting, they kind of give you this blank stare, like, you what now and why? Um, one of the other one of the other challenges that comes from something really positive in the homeschooling situation is that they have one on one interaction all the time. Um, they don't have to raise their hand and wait to have a question answered unless they have seven siblings, you know, but um, typically speaking, they can go straight to the source and they get their answer right away. Um, and we see that play out in class and that can be an extremely positive thing, but it can also be at times challenging because they'll come straight up to us and just be like, Hey, sensei, I need, and <laughs> they'll just completely interrupt sometimes in the middle of warmups, you know, we've had that experience and then we have to stop and go, Hey, you know what? Your question's not wrong, but this is how we work in a group setting. So everybody gets to be shown the same respect and given the same ex experience. Mm. And that's something that has to be learned in our class because it's not learned in school. Is that wrong? Not necessarily. It's just, it is a challenge. And it's something that once you recognize it can, you know, once you recognize it, you can address it before it becomes a problem. Um, but it was something that kind of blindsided us at first. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you do now to head that off? There, or do, you, do you set that expectation with parents? Or with yeah. The kids? Yeah, we've written an introductory letter. Um, to new or prospective students and just said, hey, this is what it looks like. Uh, your kids are more than welcome, but we'd like them to hear what kind of just a basic outline of the decorum that we expect in class. And we'd like them to hear that. You can read it to them. They can read it to themselves depending on their age. Um, and if you feel like there's anything that's not real clear, we'd be happy to meet with them mm -hmm. uh, and go through it. We've also started, I think in the last year or so, uh, every single new student, we have a private one-on-one -on -one lesson first. Their very first lesson is, oh, okay. and that gives us an idea of um, kind of their personality, uh, how they interact with us. We can explain and answer any other questions. If they're super quiet and they don't ask any questions, we just talk a lot and try and get as much information to them as we can. Um, and then when they come into class, you know, at that lesson, we kind of go, okay, now you're most welcome to sit off to the side and watch the class that you're going to be a part of starting next time. Right. So trying to give them that intro as opposed to just throwing them in and then having the expectation. And, you know, we've had, we have a decent amount of students who go to private or public school. They walk in, they know the drill. Oh, class line up. Yeah. Okay. We line up. We do this, you know, we wait in line for the drinking fountain. We do all that. So, yeah. Yeah. Sensei Jason, any, any expectations that you set? For new students? Well, I was going to jump in with uh, challenges because you jog my memory. Oh, um, yeah, please. Um, and this this isn't unique to homeschool, but one of the challenges I do remember was deconstructing the martial arts myths. Uh, somehow that got carried into, to, to, into things. Um, I frequently teach with my shoes on um, and explain why we do that and why we practice with shoes off and all that. And I remember a student questioning me, oh, karate, you're supposed to have shoes off. It's not real karate unless it's, uh, you have your shoes off. And I said, uh, young sir, have you ever been in a fight? And he goes, yeah, actually I have a couple of times. I was like, how many times did you have your shoes off in a fight? <laughs> oh, okay. And then we moved on. Um, the other thing was, uh, and this goes into expectations is when a new family would hear about it. Um, and I had one family that was, it was actually a current student's cousin. The parents were really, really excited. So they dropped off the cousin with the aunt and then the aunt dropped off the kid in the class in the middle of me teaching a class, we were in line doing drills and she just pops in and puts them in the cousins, put them next to the cousin. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hi, can I help you? She's like, oh, that's his cousin, walks out. I'm like, oh, okay, well. <laughs> mm. So um, yeah, I think I should have made uh, expectations a little bit uh, more clear with that, particularly with the sign up uh, process. And we need a waiver, we need you to <laughs> actually talk to the people, not yeah. just drop your kids off um, yeah. type of thing. Um, 
So as far as expectations with that, I was just, I'm, I'm always just really clear with what we expect, um, typically in the down to the class level. This is what we're going to do today. This is what I expect you to do. Um, so there's never really any issues um, there with it being received well. Um, just here and there are goofy things that, that I don't really attribute to anything, just, you know, kids being kids or misunderstanding or maybe not, not enough clear things. So I learned something from Sensei Jenny already introduction awesome. letter <laughs> awesome I was, I was i was hopeful i was hopeful you would you would be teaching each other as well as right, the rest right. of us and we learned that through trial and error so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's let, let's let's build on that for a moment then if you if you listen to martial arts radio extensively you know I, I like to ask these retrospective questions i like to learn from mistakes and i like to learn from other people's mistakes more so you know, I, making a mistake is fine. Avoiding it's even better. So if you were to have the figurative time machine, I'm so fond of, of calling down in the midst of my interviews and be able to go back to, you know, early on in your homeschool programs, what would be the bits of advice you'd be giving to yourself? You know, do this, don't do that. We've covered, I'm sure, quite a bit of it, but what other things? And we'll, we'll bounce it back to Jason to start. Um, I would have to say be more inquisitive. So my homeschool, well, one of them, uh, I did one at the church and I did one at the local YMCA. And I had the privilege of being at a new launch of a brand new YMCA mm. and being basically in charge of all the programs. So in addition oh. to a regular program, we had an adult program, family martial arts, something called executive for 35 and adult, uh, adults 35 and older. We had preschool martial arts and homeschool martial arts. Um, Homeschool, I want to say we had 11 people sign up for that middle of the day class. Um, the evening class was interesting. Uh, 81 kids signed up for that. Later, I found out that I believe, I can't remember, it was either 11 or 13 of those kids were actually homeschool kids that actually went to the evening class for whatever reason. Convenience, you know, I, I just remember not asking the question and not really finding out. Um, and I saw them on a team night one time and it came up like, Hey, you're homeschooled. I'm like, do you know, we had this class. I'm like, Oh, we didn't know. So um, maybe a little, it goes back to marketing a little bit more self-promotion and saying, you know, mentioning in the other classes. Uh, so certainly that, um, gosh, I just, I, not just expecting homeschool, kids in or I shouldn't say kids but students in that situation too um so I believe all the people that were in the midday class were homeschool stools homeschool students um but um in the case of at least one it was like a big brother situation where done with school early super smart but didn't want to go to college yet because he was 16 or 17 mm -hmm. type of thing but still in the class um, so just, I guess, keeping my eyes open for, and may, I like the term you use, Mr. Lesniak, non-traditional students, because it could be homeschooling, it could be unschooling, it could be um, some other type of school to where that person has, oh, my own kids, they went to what was called a hybrid charter school, three days a week at home, and then uh, two days a week at a learning center. Um, so there is opportunities for those students in a charter school um, to also go and join that class as well. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite the mix of, and I guess the best way that I, I can lump a, a single description is untraditional or non-traditional right. child, student, academic programs. Because what we're, what, what's, what's the core here that we're talking about? It's, it's about this different time of day. You know, if, if you're going to run, there's no, there's no reason at all that a, a homeschool child can't come to a, 4 30 5 30 p.m class nobody's gonna stop them and say yo you you don't you don't come here on the bus yeah, you, can't here, right? you can't be here right that, I, I don't see that happening so what we're, we're really talking about are the the pros and cons of building a program that is at a different time of day so jenny Time machine question to you. What, you know, what are you going back telling yourself a few years ago to, to do and not do? Without, uh, there, there is one thing that I feel like uh, I would love to go back and say, and that is actually um, there are going to be, this is not homeschool exclusive, but I feel like we've experienced it more so. There are parents who place expectations and even limitations upon us 
Mm. And at the beginning, while we were still feeling out how to run our school, we allowed that too much. We allowed them to dictate too much uh, our curriculum. Can you give us some, uh, some examples? Yeah. Uh, there was one family um, that was not comfortable with their uh, sons being paired up for any reason with girls. Mm. Um, not partner drills, not sparring, not um, even kata uh, practice. They, they really didn't want them uh, together at all, which is funny because I am a girl and I was there full day. Um, but uh, but they, they, they didn't initiate that conversation until they were already well established in our school. And then at one point they came and said, hey, we'd like to not have our sons participate in things if they're in this situation. Um, and those limitations, once we allowed that, because we didn't want to lose them as students, they were good students, um, we love them, but uh, we allowed that and that opened the door for others and them um, to come in and say, well, actually, we also don't want you to do this, or we also would like you to, in addition to add this. Um, that wasn't our plan and that wasn't our curriculum, but we started to feel very restrained by those situations. There were many, but um, at one point, I remember just thinking, I don't even feel like I'm in control of what I'm teaching. Yeah. I have to remember these kids can't do this and these kids want to do this and these kids can only do that. <laughs> and I stopped and Gabe and I had many conversations about what it looks like. Do we just start from scratch and say, we screwed up? You know, that's how it felt at times. Um, and I think that uh, because they write their own curriculum in a sense, they choose their own curriculum, they choose their own schedule, that comes more naturally to um, non-traditional schoolers. Because, I mean, like for myself as a homeschooling mom, Math didn't work. This curriculum's just not working for my kid. I'm going to drop it and grab something else. And that's working great. And we'll move on with that. I have that freedom. Um, and they felt they had that freedom in our dojo. Now, now, seven years later, you know, we, we really put our foot down at the beginning. Again, going back to learning, learning to set those expectations and say, you sign here. And if something seems unreasonable to you, we absolutely are approachable and we can discuss that. You know, if you don't understand why we do things, you know, we had one family that was very concerned about the religious aspects of what we were teaching. Mm -hmm. And they came to us and they said, we don't want our kids bowing. We don't want our kids doing certain things. And I sat down with the parents and I said, can I just explain what we do and why? And then answer your questions. And uh, that process of conversation, you know, their kids love it and they're coming and they're fully supportive now. Had we done that at the beginning with the other families and said, hey, let me talk you through what we're doing and why, and then you can choose to stay or go. Um, that would have been a much healthier thing for both sides. Mm, um, that makes sense. Jason, I saw you nodding along, especially when Jenny brought up the, the quote unquote religious aspect of right. bowing. Uh, yeah. So what, what's, what's been your experience with that? Cause from what I'm hearing, you know, based on the emails that I get, the feedback that we receive mm -hmm. at Whistlekick, this has become it, Maybe I shouldn't say becoming, but this is and can be a really big deal, especially among um, communities that have a strong faith component. Um, so um, when I started studying traditional Taekwondo, it was from a Baptist minister. Uh, and he explained on the first day I came to class that he only bows to God. So we don't bow in here. It might cool, but he would still, you know, um, one of my good friends was in there and whenever we'd spar, he'd make it a point to say, Kyung bow to each other and then, you know, give me a good show. Um, <laughs> so um, the first class I started at a Baptist uh, congregation, um, the pastor, for whatever reason, just loved Taekwondo, wanted me to teach him his kids and all that stuff. So he didn't have any problem with it. He understood the distinction, um, having studied multiple cultures. He's like pretty much telling everybody, hey, calm down. This is how people say hello in a different culture. Uh, this is why we do it here. Um, uh, but I do remember having that conversation multiple times, not just with homeschool, but with a lot of people. I don't want my kid bowing to anybody. Well, I, you know, I'm not teaching out of worship. This is a sign of respect and how we say hello, you know, right. or if we're too far apart to shake hands, you know, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I had that conversation more than once. Um, I tried to keep it short. This is how we say hello. In fact, 
you'll learn later that every movement has a hidden meaning. And I'd love to, for your kids to stick around and see the hidden meaning behind bowing and how it can be a self-defense move. Oh, mm-hmm. tell me more. Not now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, d- I have certainly had people come up and the first question out of their mouth is, do you teach bowing? Yes. Sorry, we can't be with you. Okay. Well, I hope you change your mind. Come, you know, feel free to watch a class and see if you'll change your mind, you know. Um, and it wasn't always bowing. Sometimes it was the palm and fist salute. And I'd explain the history behind that and, and why we do it. And people didn't like that, you know, gang signs or whatever. Um, that was a strange one I did get this. Oh, are you doing gang signs? Are you teaching my kids gang signs? No, <laughs> I'm not. It's self-defense. <clears throat> one of the things that, that I heard from both of you, you didn't express it this way, but being confident in your curriculum when, when you're bringing in this, uh, this demographic that may see you as a tutor more so than an instructor and an educator who's directing the curriculum to be firm, to be really solid. And no, this is what we're doing. I have a plan. I have experience with this and gently saying, take it or leave it because I'm far better to determine how to teach this to your kid than you are. Is that a a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, both yours. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm trying to think, maybe Sensei Jenny has experienced this. I don't recall, for whatever reason, and maybe I just didn't pay attention to it, having any homeschool students whose parents were also either current or former martial artists. Because um, I kind of went into it anticipating that we would mm. have that discussion. Sometimes that's a great conversation. Sometimes it's a, well, the typical, my style is better than yours. Yet you're bringing your kid to me, <laughs> you know, that, that, that whole paradox. Um, but I, I never really experienced that. That's the one thing I kind of went in expecting that I would uncover some person. And I kind of hope that it would be, okay, well, yeah, you're master so-and-so. Nobody knew you were here. Teach me. <laughs> <laughs> you were looking at it selfishly. I get that. I, can, I completely in relate. Sense, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sensei, Jen, have you had any uh, parents that were martial artists that, Wanted to give further input, <laughs> I guess. It's interesting because we have a lot of a lot of parents who have said, oh, when I was a kid, I did, you know, six months or a year or something of whatever. Um, we have had a couple of parents that currently train at different schools. Um, and then for a while, we had an adult class of uh, comprised mostly, mostly of um, parents of our students. But they started later. And that was actually a fun dynamic um, uh, for one for a multitude of reasons at the moment that class is not currently going, but it will pick up again. That's been a lot of fun on the flip side because it's kids going, Hey, I'm three, four belts ahead of my parents and um, learning how to show respect, but also help and encourage um, somebody in an authority position. It's an interesting paradox there. Um, But yeah, we do have two dads who uh, train at different schools currently and their kids train with us. And, um, it's been a very, in, in this case, for us, it's been a very chill um, experience. The, the one student, um, his, his dad is midway through the ranks at a different uh, karate school. And they just, they come home and they work out together and they compare curriculums in a very friendly way. I think it's super cool. Um, cool. He'll come back. He doesn't really volunteer much, the student, our student. But if I ask, I'll say, hey. You know, how does your dad do this or how how would he defend against this? Or whatever. Oh, yeah, we worked on that and they kind of teach it a little different. But, you know, we do this. And um, so that's a very, very neat thing to see within their family. Um, and, you know, his dad had been training back at that school when he was a little kid and wanted to get back to it. That's why he went back there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. All right. I guess let's let's start to wrap up with with this, what advice, what things that we haven't covered would you tell people? Somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'm thinking about starting this homeschool program. I, I you know, I, I'm hearing that there are some kids in the area and, and I'm getting the sense that maybe they and their families would be interested in, in me putting something together. How would I get started or what do I not know that I don't know? Or, you know, what, what would you tell them? Jason, we'll start with you. Um, research, of course. Um, 
like I said, with my own children, I was kind of frustrated and because they didn't want to let my kids in, even though in a previous state, they had been in the preschool program, ready to go into kindergarten, and they had to wait another year because of their age. Um, sure. So out of frustration, I called the Department of Education, who told me, oh, by the way, Indiana is a low regulation homeschool state. All of our curriculum is online. You know, it was just really a wealth of information. And it was really from there that this was kind of born. Um, because I started to research and then um, um, talking to people in the congregation, learning about all the different things. Um, so research and not just, you know, internet data and all that, you know, talking to people, maybe talk to your current student body, if you have one and say, hey, any of you happen to be homeschoolers, you know, how we get this started. Um, gosh. Solid curriculum, you know, is easy for me because I just decided I was teaching traditional Taekwondo no matter what. Um, um there's something we didn't really cover are your classes different you run them differently my classes became different um because even though i'm a traditional guy all the way you probably wouldn't recognize it if you came in in first class of my class you know oh, there's a lot of the questions that people have the first when they walk in oh why does he have his shoes on you know uh, which i cover um why is he so goofy you know well, learn best when they giggle i think but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean we're not working hard oh sorry um <laughs> siri decided to jump in there. I, it, my, um, my smart speakers do that too um yeah but just i just had it in my head and then when people would ask the deep questions where exactly does this come from i would show them our syllabus the syllabus i had that i was working through i'd sure. even say hey there's an encyclopedia of taekwondo Check it out. It's online. 15 volumes of everything you wanted to know and didn't want to know about this stuff. <laughs> Some people would deep dive into that. Um, so, um, but it was always for me, um, and this is something I inadvertently learned when I decided to become a martial arts teacher that meet the student where they are, bend to them, speak their language so that you can explain it better to them. Um, and I think that's how it changed versus when I was taking classes from my dad, you know. He learned in Japan. He brought that with him. It perfect fit for the inner city school situation. Basically, in so many words, sit down, shut up, do what I say. <laughs> Sensei knows all, you know, yeah. um, which doesn't quite work when you've got a, you know, seven year old homeschool student doing college level math <laughs> that may be smarter than me, probably is, um, and wants to know um, about the uh, applied physics of an outside knife hand strike. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, uh, which we would dive into. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I guess that's the other thing. Just be prepared for uh, those types of things or questions. Um, um, and with me, it was just go with it. I certainly could have said, don't worry about that or just do it. I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Uh, let's find out together. Let's, let's do this. Let's get the high speed out and let's do the technique and see, you know, how the, all this applies, you know? Um, yeah, gosh, there, there's so much, I, I think a good solid foundation of research. Um, and, and with that, what I specifically wanted to say is know about the regulations in your particular state. Um, um, I had the privilege of of having people that were in a congregation that said, yeah, here it's open. I didn't have to pay rent. Um, I had insurance covered for me. Um, so I was kind of fortunate. Um, it was a little bit different from the YMCA, even though they're a Christian organization. Budget, planning, all this type of stuff. And I had to stick strictly to the budget. So <laughs> um, be prepared for those types of things as well. Um, I'll let Sensei Jenny go in. Yeah, yeah. So, same question to you. You know, what what stuff do you want to make sure people think about before they get started in in doing something like this? I think um, obviously scheduling is huge. You talked about the opportunity of having classes midday, having classes late morning. Um, kind of the sky's the limit when it comes to thinking of starting or integrating homeschools uh, classes. I think uh, something Sensei Jason said is really important. Um, knowing your students and knowing their background at least a little bit um, and saying, at least in our, in our situation, we don't want homeschool and traditional school kids to be separated on purpose. Hmm. Um, they're all students. They're all learning the same curriculum. They're all at the same school. We're a family, right? Um, and if you can only make it to the class at noon, and so you only ever see other homeschool kids, that's fine. That's great. 
But if your schedule changes or you're with your grandma for a week, you can pop into the four o'clock class and you should feel right at home. You shouldn't feel like an outsider who happened to show up at the class that, oh, you're not usually here. And so we try really hard. I would encourage anybody who's going to attempt to have um, a homeschool class. There's nothing wrong with that. Just always make sure that you do things as a community, as a school, have barbecues, have um, all sparring day. You know, anybody can come any ranks, mm. have a no rank sparring day, have a no rank kata day, anything like that. Um, you know, something where you don't put on your belt, you just come and you just work out and get to know the students that you might not be on the same schedule with so that that community keeps being built. Um, because sometimes our students, the only, the only stable is their teacher, right? We're the only one they know. Um, and that can be, that can be challenging. And so uh, there is a stigma and you can't help. We're all human and we all find ways to separate ourselves. We just do. And we have to actually work to link and be together. So if we have homeschool students over here going to class here and we have um, adults over here and we've got preschoolers over here and we've got traditional schoolers over here and they stay in their little bubbles, they all are gonna learn well and they're gonna do fine. But if we are able to intentionally merge them sometimes and then work together, you know, kind of work separate and together, I think we, uh, we do ourselves a greater service. So just talking about uh, those ideas for people who want to start a, a class at a non-traditional time, um, just be aware that you're gonna have to be intentional to link those, to make those connections. The importance of community and building a strong community. Yeah. And I, I, this is something I've been advocating for years. You know, you, you brought up the idea of barbecues. People, people need that sense of community. And now possibly more than ever. And as we move forward, I mean, some of these things that we're seeing changing in the world right now that I brought up in, in the last episode, in case someone didn't, uh, didn't listen to that one. You should, but in case you've made it this far and you haven't gone back and listened to that, recent studies, because so many people, so many parents essentially homeschooled their kids for the last couple months of the academic year, quite a few of those parents said, hey, this wasn't as bad or as challenging as I thought it would be, and I am more likely to homeschool my children moving forward. No, not all of them, but a larger chunk than you might imagine. So I think we, we're going to see a lot of this. And, um, you know, we don't usually put dates on the episodes that we, we're doing this, but right now it's, it's July 21st. And I don't think anybody knows exactly what's going on for the fall in terms of public school and schools being open and everybody's kicking around all these different models. And I will be shocked if we don't see a big chunk of parents say, you know what? I need some sense of control over this. I'm just going to handle it. And for those of you out there that have martial arts schools and you have the ability to get a program like this launched, the time to start planning is right now because you're, you've got a huge opportunity, whether you look at it financially or you look at it in terms of benefiting your community on both sides of that. I think there's, there's a lot to be said there. So. Uh, I, I want to thank both of you for coming on. This this was great. I learned a ton. And it's funny, uh, I can always gauge my excitement level of what the guest is saying by one thing. My thought is to, how do I try to make this happen in my life? Despite not having a school, I'm thinking, okay, I don't think anybody around here does a homeschool program. Could I do one? And obviously the answer is no, but I thought about it for a few minutes. Right, yeah. trying to shoehorn that into an already crazy day. So, <laughs> I hope I, I've got a feeling that that the two of you excited people. So, thanks for doing that. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate thank you it. so much. We really appreciate the opportunity. And maybe there can be a uh, whistle kick martial arts homeschool radio. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm not running it. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm, right. I'm out of I'm out of minutes. Uh, but yeah, hey, somebody else can take that take that ball and run with it all. I'll, I'll support them all the way. Awesome. One other, maybe one other thought that other, Please. That, uh, that school owners, martial arts school owners may not think of is there's a lot of charter schools out there. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned charter schools, Sensei Jason. Um, 
uh, we were certified through two of our local charter schools as certified instructors. And what that means is we went through background checks and such. Um, and so we're on staff there, although we're not paid by them. Um, but what that means is the parents get our name and our phone number. And um, basically, we're on a list of safe people for them. Uh, and that can be really important. So as martial arts school owners, um, that may be something that you could look into. Find out what your local charter schools require. Um, and then basically you end up in their curriculum as a sports option or as an art option. Um, however you choose to bill your, your services. And the kids are still coming to your school and they're still you know, abiding by your rules. But uh, some charter schools even uh, allow for funding for that. So parents can use the charter the uh, the charter school funding to pay us for classes. So right. that's a, an option I think most people don't think of, um, but we have several families that take advantage of that, and that's been a benefit. Good to know. Right. Yeah, just to add quickly to the uh, hybrid school we mentioned, which had the online component, there is I think the largest one that I'm aware of is called Connections Academy, which mm -hmm. is an online K to K through twelve public school, if you will. Uh, but everything's done at home. So that's something else that part of your research, hey, is there a strong connections academy uh, in addition to the homeschool thing? Because these kids are, um, with our experience, it was at home, the learning coach was the parent with them. So they would be guiding them through the lessons, which meant that there was a parent at home during the day with these kids. And uh, the physical education portion of it was, hey, we're going to guide you, but make sure you do this many minutes of physical activity and report it. So another opportunity there as well. My particular school system is doing, um, we're supposed to start next week, believe it or not. Um, and it's Monday through Friday, or if you're not comfortable with that, e-learning. So mm. uh, my school system was already uh, set up for that, but they also now have an online public uh, component to where there'll be a number of students in the public school doing public school at home via computer internet type of thing. So I think what you, you hit a nail on the head that this is going to grow whatever it is, whether it's homeschool or just more people being at home or parents just saying, I want more control, you know, it's, there's going to be more people that um, will have time during the day um, to take advantage of the opportunity of the daytime classes. Undoubtedly, for yeah. sure. All right. Well, this was awesome. Thank you both. And mm -hmm. uh, I've got a feeling we'll, we'll be talking about this more in some way as we move forward. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.